So this lecture continues our discussion about the topic uh, we started in the last class, which is the moment of inertia. Um, we completed section 9.1, which essentially had to do with defining the moment of inertia and uh, showing how to calculate the moment of inertia for a simple shape like a rectangle. So today we're going to build off that and uh, talk about the content from section 9.2 which allows us to um, calculate the moment of inertia about any given axis using a theorem called the parallel axis theorem. So let's, uh, let's get started. I'll um, remind you of what we have done so far and then introduce you to the parallel axis theorem and wrap up with some uh, strategies to deal with uh, objects that have uh, uh, that are made up of composites or rather composite areas uh, and how to deal with calculating the MI for these kind of objects okay so remember the moment of inertia is uh, is the moment of the moment or the second moment of the area and uh, you can calculate it about the y-axis as the integral of x squared dA um, or x squared dV if it's 3D and um, along the x-axis as y squared dA. So one of the strategies uh, we uh, employed in calculating the moment of inertia, for example, we uh, solved for the moment of inertia of this triangle about the x-axis was to begin by taking um, horizontal strips or strips parallel to the axis that we want to calculate the moment of inertia around and then um, uh, write out the differential area element dA in terms of that strip uh, so that we can reduce it to a form that is easy to integrate yeah. and and so we were able to uh, kind of solve for the MI for this triangle here so the general technique for solving for MI is largely going to involve integration and so the strategy behind it is really to be able to simplify your integral and um, either using uh, horizontal, a horizontal strip um, or a vertical strip is the general strategy that you want to begin with when you solve such problems. Okay. And then we also introduced the moment of inertia in polar coordinates as j naught j subscript uh, 0 as integral of r square dA where r is the radial distance from um, the axis uh, or the origin about which you want to calculate the moment of inertia to an area element dA okay? and uh, one of the transformations we uh, discussed was the fact that since r square is x square plus y square you can see that your polar moment of inertia can be written as the sum of the rectangular moments and this is a very useful transformation because we will see that when you have composite areas so, so think about composite areas as being composed of different shapes right then you can calculate uh, um, the moment of inertia of the composite area as the sum of the moment of inertia of the different shapes okay so this is not very dissimilar from this idea here and the reason being that you can basically calculate the moment of inertia of each um, uh, either about each axis or for each shape uh, and then sum them up to give the total moment of inertia so this is a powerful technique that uh, that is uh, going to be useful to us down the line yeah. okay so <clears throat> today let's begin with an example um, that uh, asks us to determine uh, the centroidal polar moment of inertia of a circular area shown by direct integration okay so you can think of you know uh, you have an axis here and you have a circle right so let's say this is X and this is Y right you have a circle and let's say the circle has some radius R and I want to calculate the centroidal polar moment of inertia so let's uh, analyze what centroidal means so remember centroidal means that uh, you're calculating the polar moment of inertia about a centroid of the figure of the object so remember what the centroid was for a circle so we can 
uh, uh, the centroid you can take the centroid to be at um, um, or rather if you calculate the centroid uh, you'll find that it acts at the center of the circle right it's at the center of the circle so any axis that passes through the center of the circle is a centroidal axis and um, and so I can choose to calculate uh, my um, moment of inertia about this origin O here which is right at the center of the circle okay now we want to calculate the polar moment of inertia uh, by direct integration so we have a couple of different options right one I can start by saying you know let me take a horizontal strip and do the calculation other option is to take a vertical strip and do the calculation yet another is to take a radial strip right so if, if I look at this so it turns out that if you want to solve for a circle this radial strip is the best option so let's call this uh, distance u and the differential distance du right so my j naught is going to be the integral of u square dA from 0 to the radius of, of the circle r. So my next step is to fi figure out how to write dA. So dA as you can see for this area element is essentially the circumference of that circle so 2 pi u times the thickness or width of that annular uh, ring right and that is just du. So that's my area element and you can see that uh, area element is now expressed in terms of the radius variable u so that means I can now write down my uh, integral here as 2 pi integral of of um, u cube du from 0 to r and that is nothing but uh, 2 pi over 4 r to power 4 right and so that gives me my polar moment of inertia so that's direct integration and so we have solved for the first part of the problem uh, finding j naught the second part of the problem is to use this uh, finding of j naught and then to determine the moment of inertia of the circular area with respect to a diameter of the area so you can think of either the x-axis or y-axis as, as the diameter or as the direction along which we want to calculate um, uh, the moment of inertia and this is also turns out to be a centroidal axis so let's see how this can be done so remember that our j naught is now uh, pi over 2 uh, r4 and we want to calculate either about the x-axis or the y-axis right so so let's go to um, let's go to that part here so this is what we've done so far so remember uh, we we figured out earlier that j naught can be written as i x plus i y right? and this is nothing but pi over 2 r to power 4 okay. so now the question is that uh, we want to find either i x or i y or both in the context that we are given j naught so take a moment here and see how we could solve this issue how do we uh, uh, do we have two unknowns here and only one piece of information or do we have enough unknowns with the piece of information uh, that is known to us well think about symmetry right um, ix is about uh, this axis iy is about this axis right now if I rotate if I choose some other axis here let's say i uh, i prime you know is there going to be any difference between each of these i values well no because by symmetry uh, uh, the circular symmetry we have here the moment of inertia about any centroidal axis passing through this um, passing through the centroid is going to have the same moment of inertia so that means i x equals i y and so now immediately we can see here that i x is just going to be half of j naught which is also i y and so our uh, our moment of inertia about the centroidal axis is going to be pi over 4 r to power 4 right? so i x is pi over 4 r to power 4 so you can see that using symmetry helps us also accelerate our problem solving approach here okay okay so that's what we have 
All right, so let's now look at um, the idea behind the parallel axis theorem. And again, this is a theorem that helps us simplify moment of inertia calculations for complex shapes, or also, you know, for cases where we want to find the moment of inertia about an axis that may not be a centroidal axis. So let's look at the example here. We have a shape here, and uh, we want to calculate the moment of inertia about the shape of the shape about the axis A A prime, right? So from by definition, what we need to do is now take any area element d A in the object and uh, find its distance to A A prime. It's called y here, and perform this integral, which is integral of y squared d A. Okay. Now let's say you take a centroidal axis B B prime that is parallel to the A A prime axis. Okay. Remember, centroidal axis is the axis about which uh, the first moment is uh, zero, right? Uh, so that's the center of gravity of the body, or center of um, area of the body, okay? So that's a centroidal axis. Of course, I can draw this in many different ways. I can draw a centroidal axis like this, because C is the centroid, I can draw it like this. But uh, we want to draw it so that DB prime is parallel to AA prime, okay? So now think about why. Uh, in the context of uh, the centroid location C. Okay, I'm just going to get rid of this. So Y is going to be Y prime plus D. Okay. Based on the fact that area element DA is a distance Y prime from the centroid C, while C is a distance D from uh, the axis of interest is AA prime. So now I go back and put this uh, uh, substitution into i, so I see that i about a a prime is integral of y prime plus d whole square d a. So if I expand this, I see that I have three terms. So one is y prime square d a, okay, uh, plus integral of two d of y prime d a plus d square integral of d a. So we have three terms here. So now let's look at each of these three terms. Uh, since this integral is over y prime, so what we are doing here is we are calculating the moment of inertia uh, about axis c. So this is the m i about uh, b b prime, right? the centroidal axis that we have drawn. So let's call this i bar for a moment. This has special uh, significance. The I bar is used when we calculate the moment in inertia about the centroidal axis. So let's call it I bar. Now let's look at term two here. Where do you think this is going to integrate to? Remember, we're integrating y prime dA about the centroidal axis C now. And by definition, that should give us a zero. Because for any point y out here, I have a similar point y prime on the other side and that essentially is the definition of the centroid of the object right so this term goes to zero and finally the third term here is just an integration over the total area so this is nothing but d squared times the area of the object so what it tells you is that my um, my uh, moment of inertia about a a prime is the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis plus a times d square, where d is the distance between b b prime and a a prime. And this, in essence, is some called the parallel axis theorem, that the moment of inertia about any axis a a prime is going to be the sum of the moment of inertia about a centroidal axis uh, of the object, um, uh, where the axis is parallel to a a prime. So b b prime is going to be parallel to a a prime plus the area multiplied by the square of the distance between uh, b b prime and a a prime okay so the distance is d so this is your parallel axis theorem so just to state it um, in a in a rigorous way the parallel axis theorem states that the moment of inertia of an area with respect to any axis a a prime is equal to the moment of inertia about a centroidal axis parallel to a a prime so this is this b b prime is parallel to a a prime plus the product of the area a so this is area a and the distance d 
square uh, and the square of the distance between the two axes. So this is exactly what we have. I a a prime equals I bar plus a d square. Okay. So this is going to be uh, what we will use um, in solving for problems when we want to find the moment of inertia about an arbitrary axis uh, located anywhere with respect to the body of interest. Okay. So let's try out one example here of the parallel axis theorem. So what we want to do here is find the moment of inertia of the circular object with respect to the tangent t of the circle. So obviously you can go ahead and do uh, the integration of an area element t a about the axis t um, but as you can see it's going to be a challenging integral right because you have to uh, think about creating either strips like this uh, or some other way to solve this integral the second approach is to use the knowledge that we know we know what i bar is for this circle right we just calculated it uh, a few slides back and that was nothing but pi over 4 r to power 4 and that was about the centroidal axis right so for example if i take this as my centroidal axis bb prime then um, my uh, moment of inertia about this bb prime is going to be given by uh, by pi r pi by 4 r 4 r to the power 4 okay so this is what it is okay so now we want i uh, about t and so by the parallel axis theorem uh, what we know is that it is a sum of the moment of inertia about um, the centroidal axis plus the sum of uh, plus the area multiplied by the square of the distance between the two pieces. So that is going to be i bar plus the area of the circle which is pi r square times the square of the distance between the two axes which in this case is basically the radius as you can see here and that's going to be r square right so my final solution here is that this is pi by 4 r to power 4 plus pi r to power 4 and that should give me 5 by 4 pi r to power 4 and so you see how straightforward it is once we uh, realize that this is very well suited to the application of the parallel axis theorem for a calculation okay so so make sure to uh, uh, do this yourself with a different shape so you can uh, get some confidence with interpreting how to apply the parallel axis theorem okay so that's our answer here okay so finally let me end with uh, giving you a general picture of how we are going to solve for the uh, moment of inertia of for composite areas and in the next video lecture we will actually work through some example problems right so think about a composite area you know made of several areas a1 a2 a3 etc so you know you have something like this uh, let me redraw this so let's say you have something like this right and and so you have this overall shape that might be broken up into separate areas like this as a1 a2 a3 etc a4 so the question is now what do i how do i write uh, let's say i have an axis here a, a prime and i want to write the moment of inertia of this entire body so this is basically going to be the sum of the moment of inertia of each of the eyes a eyes right and that's what uh, it's going to look like so what we will need to do is to break up a complex shape into the simple shapes like squares rectangles circles things like that so that we can then write down the individual moment of inertia either by looking at a table or by doing the calculation uh, using parallel axis theorem uh, so that we can uh, write down the final moment of inertia so um, so that's what it looks like as um, as a starting point, here is a part of the table in the textbook that shows you the moment of inertia for different uh, common shapes um, uh, with the moment of inertia calculated about different axes. For example, this is um, this is about a centroid axis i x prime, which is this one here. Another centroid axis i y prime. So since it's a rectangle, you have two different values. Uh, also about an axis uh, parallel. Uh, to ix prime which is ix 
shown here, IY shown here, um, and then a polar mode inertia about the point C. Okay. So, uh, so remember, polar moment of inertia is nothing but IX plus IY. Um, or in this case it will be ix prime plus iy prime similarly you can see uh, triangle the circle these are objects that we have looked at so uh, look at the table in the textbook um, or rather the figure in the textbook and you will see many more shapes and their moment of inertia about different axes and different uh, points uh, in the body okay now one of the reasons we have uh, really talked about this subject is the fact that uh, knowing the moment of inertia for construction shapes that are used widely in construction is of uh, importance because it tells us uh, how the moment is going how the object is going to react to uh, an applied load right ultimately we're trying to calculate you know using the moment of inertia how resistant an object is to bending and twisting or rotating about uh, about an axis so it turns out that there is a handbook that catalogs all the different uh, parts that are used in constructions you know the different shapes uh, different materials etc and and all their information is provided in terms of the moment of inertia the dimensions and things like that okay. so you can see here uh, the axis for the moment of inertia calculation has been specified and then based on uh, on the size of the beam or the uh, the uh, object or the part uh, you pro it, it, they provide the moment of inertia calculation in terms of dimensions such as uh, millimeters uh, in this case uh, uh, which is multiplied by a prefactor of 10 to power 6 so that you can also convert it into meters if you want to so anyway this is something that uh, is useful to know that this is information available to you for these different shapes uh, in this case these are steel parts that are used widely in construction and so so that is uh, somewhat good news in the sense that many construction parts have already been laid out with their moment of inertia yeah. okay so let me summarize uh, today's topic uh, today's lecture so we did an example calculation of the moment of inertia where we calculated the MI for the circle and you know we were able to calculate the polar moment and then also uh, use the idea uh, uh, relationship between the polar and the rectangular moments to find out what the rectangular moment was about one of the centroidal axes then I introduced um, the parallel axis theorem and again we applied that to an example where we wanted to calculate the moment of inertia about a tangential line uh, touching a circle and we uh, saw that we could apply it by first calculating the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis I prime and then adding to it the product of the area times the square of the distance between the two axes okay. in the next class we will work on examples that involve calculating the moment of inertia for uh, for composite objects uh, so with that we come to the end of section 9.2 which is um, which is also the end of the of the chapter 9 content that I plan to cover here and so now let's prepare to work out some example problems in the next class thank you